morning. Goodness. Good morning, Doug. How are you this morning? Uh, good. How are you, Rich? Everything uh, well and where you are? Uh, uh, everything. It's, it's hot here. <laughs> where, tell me where you are. New Orleans. Okay. I'll bet it is. I'm in Florida and it's hot here too. It's 81 already. Yeah. Wait, I don't know. What, what is it outside right now? 84, oh, 85. Boy. Oh boy. It's supposed to go to 95, uh, right? Real temperature and something like a hundred and something. Uh, what is it? The feels like or whatever they call yeah. it. When are you heading to Highlands? But, and we've had rain almost every day, so. Are you going back to North Carolina? Uh, yeah, probably in September. Uh, I had a I had a little stroke, uh, mini stroke, I guess it was, and I seem to be have recovered from that. But uh, it, we're trying to get everything together and get back up there sometime in September, or early October. Goodness, well, you seem fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you feel you feel good. I, I feel very well. Good. That's great. That's great. They finally discontinued. I was doing the therapy and they said, we can't do any more for you. You all, you all fixed up. So get, get out of here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good news. That is oh good yes. News. Oh yes. That is good news. Well, you came to, uh, I'm glad you're feeling healthy and strong because we got a tough parable today. <laughs> there you go. I was wondering if, if you only tell one story, would that be less than a single instead of a parable? Never mind. <laughs> you haven't lost your touch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have not. It's lost a little early. It's a little early in the morning. So. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, Irv. How are you this morning? I'm great. Here. How are you? Good. Where are you in Florida, Doug? Uh, Amelia Island, which is near Jacksonville. Jacksonville, I got gotcha. well, the, on a barrier you with those storms that went up the uh, Florida coast? Because we, had, we had some heavy rain and some winds, but nothing serious. No, nothing serious. We were very fortunate. Very fortunate. Yeah, we're the northernmost barrier island in Florida. If you go to the north end of our island, you look across the bay, you're looking at Georgia. Wow. You guys want to get your Bibles out? We're going to look at Luke 16. Okay, let me carry it. Or if you don't have one close by, I'll read it to you. Write it on my iPad. Well, you got a beautiful fireplace there. Is that what that, that is? is? Yeah, yeah. We have a. I'm in my. I'm in our dining room. We have a big fireplace that separates our dining room and living room. So it opens on both sides. It's kind of neat. So that's very, very beautiful. Whoever did that stonework had a nice touch. Well, thank you. Not for, not that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for choosing someone who was so good. <laughs> right. right. Luke, what, what chapter? Uh, 16. Okay. Sixteen. There we go. New standard revised. Yeah. Any anything works. Yeah. That's what I always use. So. Yeah. I thought that was pretty much yeah. the standard. Uh, that's now, what I used to when I was coming up. It was always the uh, King James version, but uh, yeah, uh, that that seems to have been replaced here. There was, King James Version was written so long ago that the English used is a little different than what we're used to. Shakespearean, huh? <laughs> well, and, there were, and there were typos, as we call them now. <laughs> said, the commandment about murder said, thou shalt murder. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's some times when that might just apply. <laughs> yeah. There were a few typos in the first King James. I think when somebody cut you off on the interstate, that would, that might apply. <laughs> <laughs> they should have a thing at the en entrance to the interstate where you waive your right to swear at somebody when they cut you off because you know it's going to happen. Yeah. 
Oh, what do you th what do you guys think about the 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 that group up in Portland burning Bibles? I, I, thought, I said, man, if they wanted to disassociate themselves with the with the Christian community, uh, the religious community, that was certainly a way to do it. I didn't see that. That's awful. Yeah, well, it, it, it was it was a big deal on the on the news, and I just. I don't understand that. I don't understand uh, that. The whole thing, it's just, it, it's so obviously communist inspired. It just, you know, what, what can I say? It is, it is obnoxious. That's what you can say. Yep. Certainly, y'all haven't had that problem up, I guess, up in Cashews. You probably don't have that many riots. <laughs> I'm not aware that we've even had any demonstrations. So. <laughs> even peaceful ones, so. It, it, Unfortunately, I think there are a lot of peaceful, most of it's peaceful demonstration, but they, it all gets discolored by the violence. So. Yeah. Just a few people can mess it up, can't they? Oh, they sure can. <laughs> mess everything up. So. Yeah. Hello, Bob Welcome Brown. Colored. How you doing? I'm can good. You can you hear me? Absolutely. Good, good. I was having some Zoom problems with my audio, and I had to call... Uh, iTunes to get it corrected. So this is my first test, but good. So far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. When I have when I have technological problems, I call my grandsons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I start for sure. Cool. That didn't work this time. Absolutely <laughs> correct. My cell phone. My goodness. Yeah. That's the most challenging thing right now. Oh my. Well, yeah, Rich, really how are you? Uh, Rich, how are you doing after your little episode there? You better. Uh, yes, yes. We were just talking about that. I had a few jokes this morning, so uh, apparently my brain is still in in gear. Good. You, Good. Bob. The the joking half of your brain, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing that's, all right. I'm that's doing all right. Most of his brain. It's not a half. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently, they whatever it was was very minor, and uh, I've law I've regained all of the the motor functions, which which, which were just very, just a little in my hand. I had a problem, I, I got trouble writing and, but all that's gone away. Everything seems to be okay. Good. And they check seems to say uh, I'm back up to a hundred percent. So other, other than the fact I'm getting old, other than that, that's. That, uh, that's happening to all of us. <laughs> Golden years, right? Golden years. Good morning, Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, how are y'all doing? Fantastic. Hey, Murdoch. Well, it's 9.02 according to my computer. Shall we get started? Let's do. Once again, I'm going to pray from my favorite guy down the road from you all that are lucky enough to be up in cashiers, Walter Brueggemann, um, our Old Testament Hebrew scripture, uh, probably most famous scholar in the, in the world. Let's pray. Liberator, Redeemer, Emancipator, for your power that notices, your passion that descends, your freedom that liberates, we thank you. We hold in your presence all those things hurting, in fear and despair and poverty and weakness, in crime, war and violence, and narcissism and self-indulgence. Work your wonders among us in your strength like war, in your gentleness like nursing, in your abiding love like forever. Work your wonders. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So let's see, a friend of mine, and I got to share this with you, uh, sent me one of these little pass it on things that you get in the email. Some of you may have already seen this, but we need to start light because this is the hardest parable, uh, allegedly the hardest parable. Uh, that Jesus ever spoke. So let me start with a couple of light ones here. I changed my car horn to gunshot sounds. People get out of the way much faster now. <laughs> Very good. I didn't make it to the gym today. That makes five years in a row. <laughs> and then the, my favorite, I don't know why when you hear it, Last year, I joined a support group for procrastinators. We haven't met yet. <laughs> Very good. Anyway, I like those little things that you get. So here we are, Luke 16, uh, 1 through 13. 
parables about money. Parables about money. Let me read this to you. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man, the manager, was squandering his property. So he summoned the manager and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my ma master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I, have I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He, he said to him, no, I'm sorry, how much do you uh, owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commanded, commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Let me say that again, that's eight. I'll say it one more time, it's, it's so shocking. And his master commended the dishonest ma manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have, you have been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Well, what do you all think about that one? <clears throat> well, I certainly think that uh, that's the one place in the Bible that prohibits bigamy when he says, no man can serve two masters. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. Sorry about that. You <laughs> haven't lost any of your edge. Yeah, he's well. He's, he's doing well. just fine. Uh, <laughs> too well. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is called, the title of this is The uh, Unjust Steward or The Dishonest Steward. And it's, uh, it's a little shocking. Uh, people say that this is the mo most notoriously difficult parable Jesus ever spoke. Um, people characterize it as a puzzling parable, uh, baffling. Um, and some are so baffled with it that they say that Jesus could not have possibly said this. So they dismiss it completely out of hand, which I don't think is right. I don't, I did think, I do think Jesus said this. Uh, and I do think it is notoriously difficult, maybe the most difficult parable. Um, for those of you that are English majors, it's a single indirect narrative parable, also a how much more parable, which is not immediately obvious, but I think important. And it has a concluding explanation in verse 8b and an application in verse 9. Um, it makes it more difficult if we try and hold it all together. I think the consensus of academics is that the parable probably ends at nine and 10 through 13 is not especially or uniquely applicable to this parable, but is applicable to all that comes before it. So sev several uh, chapters, several chapters before this where, where Luke, uh, morning Lane, where Luke is, um, where Luke is talking about money. Uh, Luke talks more about money than any of the other 
uh, gospel writers. And this is a section that's deep into uh, Luke's um, uh, discussion that following Jesus's words uh, all about money. So not that the others don't talk about money, but if you, on a scale, Luke talks more about money than do any of the other um, gospel writers. So this parable probably ends at verse nine. And I'll talk about verse 10 through 13 almost separately at the end of our little discussion here. Uh, but I wanna focus on one through nine because that is certainly the uh, beginning and the end of the, uh, of the parable. So here we have uh, a master uh, who praises his servant, who praises his servant for doing a dishonest act. Um, and it's hard to kind of get around the fact that Jesus is, is saying uh, in this parable, this story, that uh, this master, who would be God or Jesus, is, is saying that what this, what this, uh, this uh, manager, what this manager did uh, was good. And even though it clearly was dishonest, uh, what he did was he, went, he knew he was in trouble. So he went to the people that owed his master money and cut their bill in half in one instance or reduced it 20% in another instance to ingratiate himself so that after he had been fired, he would have the possibility of being welcomed into their homes, maybe getting a job or at least not having to beg on the street. That's really what happened here. So uh, Luke, uh, this is the most perplexing thing Luke says about money. Um, I said earlier that Luke spends a lot of his energy focusing on what Jesus said about money, both in this gospel and, and in volume two of Luke. What's, what's the proper name for volume two of Luke? Acts of the Apostles or Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Renamed. Acts, uh, Acts of the Apostles, volume two of Luke. Exactly right. So um, only Luke uses the word steward or stewardship None of the other gospel writers use that word. And Luke uses those words solely in this passage with the exception of chapter 1242. So Luke's focus on stewardship uh, is unique among the gospel writers and it's most uh, prevalent uh, here uh, in this particular passage. So what's going well, could on? I mention, could sure. I mention something real quick? And I, I'm not exactly sure where I read this in the, in the past in terms of things, but this parable is a little different if um, we consider or think about that the dishonesty began prior to the action of this parable, that the people owed so much money because they had been overcharged, and the dishonesty started with their bills being um, Inflated. twice as much or three times as much as they should have. So he was actually re returning some of the honesty. The dishonest wealth was, was being used sort of to reverse what had been dishonest in, in the a, past. And I hadn't, interesting, hadn't thought about that before. Interest, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting statement, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I, I mentioned, I'll mention something, not exactly that, but I'll mention something like that in a minute. Let me just sort of do the cultural thing here for you. These debts are very large debts. So a hundred jugs of oil or a hundred baths of oil is about 900 gallons of olive oil. It is the yield of 150 olive trees and probably worth between, in today's dollars, a hundred and $150,000. So we're not talking about some little farmer here. You know, we, we think, in small numbers when we think about Palestinian farmers. This, this is a, a big time transaction. 100 containers of wheat is about 1,100 bushels of wheat, enough to feed between 100 and 150 people for a year. It's the uh, product of about 100 acres of wheat. And in today's dollars would be worth between 250 and $300,000. So these are big numbers. First number is between 100 and 150. Second number is between 250 and $300,000. It's interesting that uh, in each case, I mean, 
It's interesting, but I have no answer for you why this is. <laughs> so I'll preface it by saying that. In each case, the steward reduces the bill by the same amount, about 500 denarii or about $60,000. So he cuts the first bill in half, which is about $60,000, and he reduces the second bill by 20%, which is about $60,000. I, I can't tell you the significance of that or anything else, but it's not readily apparent until you do the numbers math. So um, they, these, these farmers might have been what we now call tenant farmers, where they agree to pay a portion of their produce to the master who owns the land. Um, we don't know for sure, because it's not as clear as it could be. Um, the steward was almost certainly not a slave. Uh, he was an agent for the master and then as now in our law, in their law and our law, when an agent speaks for the master, it is as, as if the master is talking. So if the steward says your debt is reduced 20%, it's as if the master uh, had, his, uh, had said the same thing. So when the steward spoke for the master, it was uh, a, f a done deal. Um, in, an, in the Mediterranean world, and this helps to understand it a little bit, uh, a benevolent act brought with it an expectation, almost an obligation, that it would be repaid. So we, we, uh, we observe that to some extent in our culture. If someone invites you to dinner, you feel some obligation to invite them to dinner. Um, if someone loans you their shovel, you feel some obligation to loan them your hoe. Uh, but in the Mediterranean world, it was a stronger obligation. So when this guy is cutting these debts, he's doing it remembering that the obligation in his world was that people would pay him back after he didn't have his jobs. So here are theories that are, are, have been advanced. There's nothing wrong with them. I think they're probably wrong, but there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, one theory is that the steward canceled the interest on the debt, not the principal, just the interest. And the reason that theory is not a bad theory is because charging a Jew charging a Jew interest was prohibited by the Torah. Uh, in theory, a Jew could charge a non-Jew interest and it was okay on a debt, but a Jew, this is from Leviticus, a Jew charging a Jew, another Jew interest was prohibited <clears throat> Not that it wasn't done, but it was prohibited. Um, or that the steward received a commission on what he collected and he was foregoing or waiving his commission. I don't think either of them are right. Um, I like Rob's statement better that there had been overpricing, so to speak. I don't mean to summarize it um, that briefly, but that they'd been overpricing in the beginning and he was just trying to do the right thing. Um, now, those who would ignore this parable because it's so hard um, need to uh, deal with the fact that Luke put this in a very prominent place in his gospel. Um, and Luke thought that Jesus' statement was very, very important and compelling. And so you know, we can say it's so hard that we don't think Jesus said it, or it's so confounding or conflicting to our ethical standards and rules that we can say Jesus didn't say it. But if we believe that Paul did put it in an important place, which he did, Paul is telling us, Jesus said this and you can't ignore it. And you can't pretend Jesus didn't say it. So face up to it and try and figure it out. Um, so... The, the structural questions are, must we include volume, uh, volume must we include uh, verse nine? <clears throat> and the answer is yes, uh, because if you look at your Bible, uh, these words do fit with the parable. And the preface is, and I tell you, which are when Jesus is about to say something important. So we must understand that we can't exclude 8b or verse nine from this parable. Um, Jesus said, and I tell you a lot of times, 
if you want sites, I can give them to you, but Matthew 18, 13, 21, 43, and 24, 47. Those are three from Matthew. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the relationship of verses 10 through 13 are, um, as I said earlier, not requisite to understanding this parable. They're important, but they're not requisite to understanding this parable because the general view is that they are summarizing um, a couple of chapters. Hold on just one second, please. Uh, uh. Two, two things, uh, Rob, where did you get this, that, that he had charged, that he had charged too much to begin with? I, I, I don't, I don't see that in there. Uh, if you, 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 you make any uh, assumption that the master himself was, was dishonest in what he, in what he was charging the people uh, for the olive oil and the, and the wheat, et cetera. You may have lost Rob for a minute. Okay. He's on, well, he's on mute also. Okay. Well, let me, let me answer that. I think there's been a lot of discussion of trying to kind of duck this parable and try and make the steward seem better than he might be, seem more honest than he might be, or trying to do the right thing here at the end of his career with this guy. Um, I think we should, I think we should, that's an all, all those, all those things are a possibility, of course, but I think we should not duck the fact that this steward was probably a bad guy. Probably did not only a dishonest thing, but probably an illegal thing. So um, I think we should kind of face it head on and, and see where we go from there. And if we can't get it, then we can fall back and try and make him better than he was. Doug, why do you think that? It seems like to me the steward uh, benefited both the farmers and the, the master. You know, he cut back the debt and then he collected the balance for the master. So, I mean, he seemed like a pretty good guy. And then you have this uh, dishonest wealth in the last uh, verse. And where does that come from? Unless Rob is correct. Well, I think uh, the steward was, uh, was pretty good. He took half a loaf, but. Well, and I think any any business person, if they have a, a loan they can't collect, they write it off, and this is, you know, say you can get fifty dollars out of what was a hundred dollar debt, that would be normal business. Otherwise, you're writing off the whole, right out of the whole hundred. Half a is loaf that, is better than half a loaf is better than nothing. Well, is there anywhere in the parable that suggests that the debt is was a bad debt? I don't think so. <clears throat> I think the parable never says that the debtors weren't going to pay their full debt or couldn't pay their full debt. I think the implication was that the steward was trying to ingratiate himself by doing something that was unnecessary, by giving the debtors a break that they weren't entitled to by law, certainly, to ingratiate himself so that after he lost his job, he would be in a better position to survive. Uh, I, that's certainly the way I read it. Uh, I just, <laughs> like you said, I have, I'm having trouble with it because it, uh, <laughs> well, the conclusions that, that are come, come later on, it just it, uh, it seems to fly in the face of, of, of uh, being Everything. honest with, with the, in your dealings. Exactly. So one of the authors I read said, the steward either did, one, something just and effective, or two, something unjust and effective. And this particular author said, his reduction was unjust, but effective. It was, a, it was a violation of the law, a violation of his trust, but it benefited him because now the debtors liked him better uh, and he had lost his job and maybe he could survive. That's, that's what, you know, it's a, it's a tough deal. No. So, so, so in the real world, in the real world, what would have happened? In the real world, he would have been punished by this, this, the master, or he would have been indicted and put in jail, or he would have been, who knows what, what would happen. This is not the real world, this is a parable. I said a couple of times earlier in the summer that parables are pseudo-realistic. This is, we, we, can, we can in this instance and in other instances, we cannot use 
real world uh, ethics and morals here because it's pseudo realistic. I mean, another pseudo realistic part of it is that the debts are huge. I mean, can you imagine some little Palestinian farmer owing somebody three hundred thousand dollars? It's just it's kind of crazy. Uh, or even one hundred fifty thousand dollars, the first guy. So, it, so the question is, if if it's not totally realistic, what's the message? What is Jesus trying to say? Um, it's it's very very difficult. The story is told up to eight B. So let me read you eight B and then nine again, because <clears throat> the whole story ends at eight B, and this is where it gets tough. 8A is, and his master commended the dishonest manager. Now, this flies in the face of a little bit of what Rob said, because, you know, if he was just trying to do the right thing, Jesus wouldn't have characterized him as dishonest. He's clearly being characterized as dishonest. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. So he was, a, he was, he was shrewd but dishonest. That's, that's the hardest part of this whole parable. And then it well, goes again, on. Just, just for a second. Yeah. If a shrewd is, if you already have a shrewd master and he wants you to practice shrewdness and you're practicing shrewdness, then obviously he's going to commend you for being shrewd. Now we may not commend someone for being shrewd, but a shrewd person is going to commend someone for being shrewd, just like screw tape is commended is commending his guy for for doing the doing the wrong thing yes uh and so that's that's again it, it's hard to to understand the, the framework of this and, and the commending but if you're if you're trying to teach your underling to do the the wrong the shrewd thing then of course you're going to commend him in that and that's serving wealth the shrewd in that type of thing but versus you're the versus master, serving god if you're the master and the shrewdness that your steward does cheats you out of half of the debt, you're not gonna be happy if, if you're a shrewd master, if your debt just got cut in half because you fired this dishonest guy. Anyway, let me, let me uh, go on to 8B, which is where Jesus is now starting to talk and say, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Unfortunately, Jesus's words as written by Luke are not easy to understand, at least for us. Maybe they were easy to understand for the, um, the uh, apostles or the disciples who heard it or others who heard it, but it's certainly not easy for us. So this is what Jesus says at the end of commending where the master commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. This is what Jesus says. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their gen own generation then are the children of the light. That's what Jesus says. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of the light. And then he goes on to say, and I tell you, whenever Jesus says, and I tell you, that means listen carefully. He's giving you, giving it to you straight. If we can understand it, it would be great if we could understand it a little easier, maybe. And I tell you, Make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. So 8B and 9 are hard. So let me try and unpack 8B and 9, and then we will move on to 10 through 13, which I said earlier are, are probably a summary of not just this parable, but other chapters of Luke. So, um, so what are we talking about, about uh, 8B and 9? In 8B, Jesus marks off two arenas that operate in different ways. He contrasts this age and the generation of the children of light. He's talking about millennials and their parents, isn't he? <laughs> You know, with all the political stuff going on, my new favorite ad, <laughs> my new favorite ad is where a donkey is talking to an elephant. I don't know whether you all have seen this. Yeah. And the elephant is looking through a telescope. And the, have you seen this ad? And the donkey says to the elephant, what are you looking for in the telescope? 
and the elephant says, I'm looking for the planet that you live on. <laughs> and then, and then, and then, and then there's this kind of pause, and then the donkey says, well, you might want to take the lens cover off. <laughs> anyway, um, so, <laughs> um, so now we're talking about contrasting this age, Jesus uses the words this age, and the other is those who are the children of light. So what does that mean? I was to ask you, what, what, do you, what does he mean by the children of light? Yeah, that's the question. So this age is clearly the age that those people lived in then and the age that we live in now. And then the question is, that the hard question is, what is the, who are the children of light? And, where, and where, what age do they live in? First of all, it's important to acknowledge, and I don't mean, I don't mean to be nitty gritty here, but it's important to acknowledge that Jesus sa is saying, there are children of the light they're, they're, they're existing now. We have children of the light to compare to children of this age. What does that mean? That means that we have people existing now who are living in the kingdom, the kingdom of God, which is already here. He's saying, impliedly, that the kingdom of God is not something that will come only in the future. Yes, it will come in the future, but it's here now, and it's here now because I'm here, because Jesus Christ is speaking, saying, I, Jesus Christ, am here, and therefore the kingdom is here on earth because of my coming to this earth and ministering to you, dying for you, and being resurrected for you. So people that follow Jesus are the children of the light. People that are of the age are people that are not following Jesus. Okay? So an another, I'm going to quote, I'm going to read a quote to you that may help you out as well, because those were my words and they weren't very clear even to me. Um, the praise of the children of this age is an accusation against the children of light. Don't forget, Jesus praises the people of this age. He, he's praising these, these people. He says, for the children of this age, I'm in 8b, um, verse 8b as in boy, for the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. He's saying the people of this age are shrewd. And what he's doing when he says that is he's contrasting people of this age against people of the children of light and the age of, the, of light, the people who are living in the, in the age of light, the, those who are following him. What he's saying is that people who are of the world, as opposed to of the spirit, if you'll permit me, are doing better in living their lives than the people of the spirit. The praise of the children of this age is an accusation against the children of light. The steward acted well in his age, in this age. The children of light do not know how to live wisely in their system. What he's saying is Christians, those who follow Jesus, are not doing very well in living within Christianity. They do not know how to live in keeping with the kingdom of God already present. What Jesus is saying is that the dishonest steward, the shrewd dishonest steward, is doing better in his world then are the Christians who are trying to follow Jesus. He's contrasting the two. And we know that. We know that. It's easier for us uh, to live in our world and prosper and get along and make a living and, and, uh, and, uh, and have some resources uh, sometimes than it is to follow Jesus Christ every day. It's easier sometimes. So... Jesus, uh, Jesus is contrasting this. Going back to verse 9. Doug, if I could interject for just a absolutely. second, I think part of what you're saying is uh, very understandable. And, and another way I see that, too, is that the children of the light, as, as, as good as they may be, still have something to learn. Absolutely. And it may not be that one is better than the other, but they have, you know, the people of this world or of this age who are living shrewdly, and maybe that is since forward thinking, thinking of the, the distant future. 
um, because that's what the, is done in canceling those debts, that the children of the light could learn a lesson from those people. Not that those are necessarily better, but you, you still got something to learn. And I think we as Christians have always got something to learn, something that we haven't seen about ourselves that we, that we need to see. And so there's a little bit of an unmasking there, I think, that, that, that's coming. No, nope, I agree with that. That, that, that gives me a thought and a question. Is it, I think that, is it relate to the idea that God, that God gives us what we need, but he looks to us, he's given us, he's given us a brain, he's given us different resources, and we have to use these resources in the process. He's not just going to hand it to us as he hands us the word. He, we have to work through it. Is, is that part of what this is saying? Yeah, I think that's right. I think two things you've said. One is um, we are blessed with resources, some greater than others, but whatever, we have resources. We live in the richest country in the world. We have resources and we have to use them correctly. And also that when we read Holy Scripture, we need to think about it, study about it, pray about it, contemplate about it. It doesn't just always jump off the page. Some of the scripture is easy to get, and, and this, would be at the, this would be at the other end of the scale, I suppose. Much harder to understand. So let's go to verse 9. <clears throat> I'm going to read you verse 9 again because it's so hard to understand. Don't forget, this is Jesus talking, not me. So don't get mad at me. Jesus says, and I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. That's Jesus talking, okay? Not Doug. <laughs> so there's three things we need to try and understand. Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth. That's one thing he said. And then he says, when it is gone, and when it fails. And then three, he says, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. <clears throat> I read that <clears throat> when I first read it, I didn't understand any one of the three statements. I had no, I had no clue what Jesus was saying. Not the first idea. And I'm sure that you all are smarter than I do, so maybe you had some idea. But after I read it 25 times and read a couple, three, 400 pages on 25 different people's view of it, I'm going to tell you what I learned. <clears throat> Not to say that it's right, but at least I'm smarter than I used to be. Um, so as you've heard the term mammon, which is in the Bible and it refers generally to money or property and often carries a bad connotation, a negative connotation. Um, and so another word for mammon is unrighteous money. Um, and I don't think unrighteous money is something that is easy to understand. So I'm gonna put it aside, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just gonna put it aside for a minute and say that I don't agree with that interpretation. I think what it really means is money of this world, money that we earn from our labor um, and our work in this world, uh, and that money doesn't always, but it has the temptation or tends to corrupt. It can corrupt. We've seen people in the news or we've known people in our lives where they have a lot of money and it's corrupted them. That's without, without, without doubt that you know somebody or you've seen somebody uh, in the news that has had a lot of money and they become corrupt. So money of this world, uh, I think, can, doesn't always have to, but can corrupt. It tends to corrupt. Versus as contrasted to true wealth, which points to eternal possessions, not of this world. That's in verse 11. If you look in verse 11, it says, if then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, or wealth of this world, who will entrust you with true riches? So we're contrasting dishonest wealth, which I say, and you can argue with me, is wealth of this world, which has the potential, not always, it has the potential to corrupt versus true wealth, which is wealth uh, of an eternal nature that comes only from God through faith in Jesus Christ. 
you might even say the wealth of friendship. Yes. The wealth of those relationships, the wealth yep. of, of love. I mean, they're yep. making, you're making friends with people rather than making friends with money yes. in, in some ways there. Yeah. Yep. So we can all agree, I think, that if you buy my interpretation or even think about it uh, seriously, that an unrighteous money really means Jesus is drawing a can contrast between true wealth and things that are have value in, in God's world, in God's w worth system, to those uh, money that we might have in our world. Now, all money doesn't corrupt. It's clear about that. But money can corrupt. And you know people, either on TV or in the news or in the newspaper or in your world, where money has corrupted them. We, we know I don't people. know any of those people. But uh, right. let, me, let me say this, Doug. <laughs> I was tripping over dishonest you know, in two or three verses. Yes. It came to me that dishonest really means shrewd. That is not that you've cheated so much, that, but that you earned your wealth in the world, working in the will, world by your shrewdness. And I think he's drawing a distinction between that and the eternal life of love and whatnot. That we've been, that's the dichotomy that I see. But I don't think dishonesty in the sense of cheating, lying, that sort of thing. I think it's more shrewdness, you know, which is kind well, of the point of the parable. Well, I, I, I part, the Greek translation is actually for that word. Um, I think that what you're saying is, is hard to argue with. I think it's correct. But bear in mind that uh, it's hard to imagine. I know <laughs> if you stay up with the news, it's hard to imagine, but we live in a relatively ethical society where business is generally conducted in an ethical way. We do. Palace, first century Palestine was not like that. People that had money cheated people every day that didn't have money. They bribed judges every day. All judges were subjected to bribes for the most part. Not everyone, but almost everyone. And so in, in Jesus's world, if you had money, it, it was easy to say that the money of this world, even if it was shrewdly obtained, uh, had a great potential to corrupt you. It was easy to say that, easier to say that then than it is now. Because we know plenty of people who have zillions of dollars who presumably are not corrupt. Uh, Bill Gates comes to mind. I mean, he has billions and billions and billions of dollars. And apparently he's given away most of it to his charities that are trying to do good things for the world. So, you know, this is a guy that's got wealth beyond comprehension, he and his wife, and they're trying to do good things with it. I'm sure they don't worry about paying for lunch, but so they live, you know, they live a, a comfortable life, but he has billions and he's giving it away. So that's not corrupt money. On the other well, hand, we know he, people- he was, a hard, he was a hard businessman. And I mean- you know, yeah, I would guess. Yeah, I would guess that he and Microsoft and had a monopoly and and it forced their way into things. I mean, it, there are there are ways that all of that wealth I, I wouldn't be able to define as honest. What? Right. And right. if we look at it, I want to continue this because I think this is a good way to think about it. You know, a, 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 an athlete, a, a golfer, a, a football player, whatever else, is making eight million dollars a year. And a, and a school teacher is making sixty, eighty thousand dollars, whatever they are. And we step back and look at it, and we think about the values that we have. Is is that really fair? Is that really honest? They're both earning it. They're both doing the work. They both work hard. They've got skills and things like that. But what? I guess that begs the question in some ways. What about wealth at a very basic level is honest? Yeah. And how we value things and how things are are disproportionate sometimes shows that we've begun to serve the wealth rather than some other underlying principle, which I think God is, is getting to. So I think to your point a few minutes ago, Doug, in some ways, all wealth can't be considered completely 100% pure and honest. No, I agree with because you. Of the, because of the systemic world that we live in and, and things that are, are disproportionate in ways that sometimes are out of our control or even out of our, our consciousness. Yep. Um, well, and so there are, there are some tricky parts about, about money. 
And, you know, that's why Jesus, I think, in other places says, sell all you have and then follow me or blessed are the poor, because in, in some ways they they've got it. They have an understanding that others others do not. And I'm including myself Dan in, Matthews in that. Said in your pulpit, Dan Matthews said in your pulpit that that was just a metaphor to sell everything you have. That he didn't really mean it. <laughs> right. Well, well, the disciples didn't really do it. And a lot of the church <laughs> hasn't really done it, too. So we, 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 that's, again, we like to write it off. Is that shrewd on our behalf to write it off? Or, or are we doing it to our own demise? Well, the other thing is there's no question that Jesus said things that were very strong and, and like anybody trying to change people's minds, any human trying to change people's minds, you need to say something strong or they won't pay any attention to you. If you want to get people from the left to the middle, you have to say something on the right. You can't say something in the middle. I mean, if you look at uh, Martin Luther, um, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, um, he said some real, or John Calvin, the ref reformers of the 16th century, they said such strong things, almost strident, almost strident. And the reason they did is because they wanted to get people to the middle. Um, so I agree with a lot, a lot of what has been said. So it's clear, I think we can agree. And, and let me give you one example, Rob, that uh, is almost a better story than your athlete. I was reading an article a couple of weeks ago about 14 and 15 year olds who play games, games on their computer. And some of them have formed into teams and they play other teams in other parts of the world. And the very best of this group and the very best teams, don't forget these people are 13, 14 and 15 years old, make $400,000 a year average. And the very best of them are making over a million dollars a year and they're 14 year old, 14 year old kids. So, there you go. That's even that's even more shocking to me than an athlete uh, like uh, LeBron James who makes so much money. So we got some issues with people making money in this world. We all agree, without question, that it is not the wealth of the kingdom of God. It's not true wealth. So I have to, I have to inject something here. Just yeah. I, I'm I'm with all of this conversation, but is it the golfer, the athlete, the the gamer? you know, the teenage gamer that's doing bad, or is it society? I mean, athletes make a lot of money because that's what society, that's what society pays for. And they don't pay enough for teachers. And I'm totally behind all that, but yep. I don't think it's the, I don't think it's, you can just rub it off on the athletes. I mean, we all have a responsibility for that. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. It's, it's a system. It's a systemic yeah. thing. And we, we're, we're in this system that, you know, I'm complicit in it. I've bought tickets to football games and, sure. and golf stuff and all those other kind of things. But when I, and you'll I, continue I'm, to I'm, do probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm driving around in a Porsche trying to sell tickets to, to buy into people's love of cars, you know, to do all that stuff. So I'm, I'm definitely, maybe well, this is, good. maybe that's shrewd. Maybe that's good that we're, yeah. we're selling up, we're selling off this Porsche to, to help right. other people. I just didn't want, I just didn't want it hanging out there that, cause I think we're all complicit in it. I didn't it's want not, it hanging out there just on the athletes and so forth. So you're hundred percent correct. It's reflective of the values of our society. Right. And, and, and so, yeah. Um, but, and I, and I, oh. and I feel really sorry for Rob having to drive around in a Porsche uh, with the top <laughs> down on a beautiful day, but, it's, you know, been horrible. it's been horrible. It's been horrible. Job. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it, Rob. So that's right. Thank you for doing that tough I'll job. Be, I'll be shrewd in those ways. Yeah. <laughs> so think, at, the of, at the University of Arkansas, we made our pact with the devil back in probably 1955, and we just put an inordinate amount of money into the football and the other athletic programs uh, to the disparagement of the library and some of the faculty and that sort of thing. But that was the pact with the devil we made and it's bread and circuses and that's what we all enjoy. And I mean, for God's sakes, Rob, let's not stop the SEC football conference. I mean, <laughs> we're not going to do that. I mean, not <laughs> even but first, it's what we want. It's what we want. First thing. Sure. Murdoch's trying to say something. Mur chime in there, Murdoch. On the society. Well, first I was just trying to say go hogs. Um, oh, okay. But also, <laughs> <laughs> Don't don't forget that just a few verses later, Jesus says, 
what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> everything that we're saying is, is just like a, a three verses later after what we're reading. So, <laughs> you know, it, it spells it out pretty quickly in chapter 16, like one of the harshest chapters in all the gospels. I mean, everything that we do is, I mean, according to Jesus is wrong. So <laughs> our values, our values. I don't know what to say about that. Our, our value system needs some uh, tinkering with to say the least. So getting back to verse nine, the first is, Make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth. Um, so I think we can say that dishonest wealth is the rewards or money of this world, some of which may be dishonest, some of which are not so dishonest. Uh, second, uh, the second, th the second statement is when it is gone or when it fails. What does that mean? It could mean when the money runs out. It could mean when we die, or it could mean when this age is over. Um, parousia, which is the coming of the new age, the age of Jesus. And the probable reference here is to the, to the, when this age is over. So that when the money is gone means when this age is over. And the final statement is, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. What does that mean? Who is they? Well, they could be angels uh, who welcome one into heaven at the pearly gate. Um, it could, uh, whoever welcomes us when we die, uh, certainly will not be outside the province of God. Uh, it, so we are either welcomed by God or by, by a being that God sends to us. Uh, we're talking about eternal homes. So we're certainly talking about a reference to God and our eternal home with God. So, I've tried to translate for you verse nine into, into more understandable words. So let me read you nine and then I'll read my translation. If you're good with that. Nine says, and I tell you, and I said earlier that when Jesus says that, we're supposed to pay attention because he's summing up and telling us something important. And I tell you, said Jesus, Make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so then when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Now let me tell you my translation. Put yourself in a good position through your use of money, which can so easily lead you astray, so that when this age is over, God will receive you into God's eternal dwelling. I'll read it again. Put yourself in a good position through your use of money, which can so easily lead you astray, so that when this age is over, God will receive you into God's eternal dwelling. What do you think? Comments? Yeah, to me, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago about eternal wealth and, and all of that, and that kind of that probably helped me more than anything we've really talked about is understanding. It gives context to the idea of dishonest wealth and, and all of that. I think this, this, this parable <clears throat> is not about um, pledging to your church on Sunday. It's, it's, it's not solely about that. Let me say, I think it's about, what we do with our wealth, uh, money, and other resources in this world, and how we reflect with our wealth that we're followers of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, giving to our church, supporting our church or churches is very, very important. Um, the uh, bride of Christ is a very important thing in our world, and we need to have we need to have strong churches uh, uh, preaching and the word of God and places for us to worship and do everything else we do in our church. It's very, very important, but it's about that, but it's also about everything else we do with our money and how, uh, I'll call it kingdom economics, how we use our money uh, and our resources. It's clearly a call to action. Um, and it's clear, it's clear that we have one foot in this world, that we're children of this age, and we have another foot in the kingdom of God 
and we're children of the light. So we have one foot where we're children of the age and another foot where we're children of the light. And one of the ways we show that we're children of the light is how we use our material assets. It's not only about giving every Sunday. It's much bigger than that. I'll read you what one of my scholars said. It's Before about- Before we do that, let me just say, yeah. I've got to head to a different meeting. Thank you very much, Doug. This has been very engaging in great ways. <laughs> Sorry to, to leave, but I got I to gotta scoot. Thank you. Okay. All right. See you next week, Rob. Peace. Peace. Um, so let me, let me read uh, to you what this other uh, author said. It's about being true to our relationship with God, who justified us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in all we do or all we do not do with all of our money, all of our material assets. It's a call to action. It's a call to action to use the money of this world uh, to reflect the fact that we have at least one foot in God's kingdom and that we're followers of Jesus Christ, including giving money to our church or churches, but everything else we do with our money as well. So it is, is it fair to say this parable is really about values? It's well, it's clearly about values and how we're supposed to live in this world. How our values in this world are supposed to reflect, how our values in this world are, have, are supposed to reflect our Christianity. Yes, you're 100% on. Yep. Doug, we've talked a lot about the word shrewd. Can it also have a negative connotation? You say somebody uh, is a shrewd negotiator. Is he skating too close to the edge or sometimes over the edge? I think it's clear that shrewd can be fully ethical and moral and it can be too close to the edge and it can be over the edge. I think shrewd can be any of those things. Yes. And that's, and, and which is a great, I love it when people ask questions that lead me where I, exactly where I want to go. So thank you for that question. So if we look at now verses 10 through 13, which I said uh, are probably separate uh, from this particular parable, but sum up all of the words of Jesus that come before it a couple of chapters back. Let me read you 10 to 13 and tell you what I think it's talking about. Whoever, is, and bear in mind, it's not necessarily strictly tied to what we've just been talking about. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, a wealth of this world, who will entrust you to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, like the steward, who will give you what, uh, what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one or love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So this obviously has relevance to what we've been talking about, but greater relevance to all of what Luke has been talking about in the last couple of chapters. And I think what, one, what these verses say, 10 to 13, is either you're trustworthy or you're not. Either you have in integrity in what you say and do in this world, or you don't. And as much as all of us lawyers like to talk about the gray areas in between good and bad, in this instance, and I agree with it, Jesus is saying, you're either trustworthy or you're not trustworthy, and you either have integrity or you don't have integrity. And there's, and there's, 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 there's not really any gray area. You either have it or you don't, and, and it's pretty clear. So let me read you a little story from my friend William Barclay. And I'm sure because you all are such well-read people <clears throat> that you know uh, a little bit about um, the 30th president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, 1923 to 1929. They called him the Sphinx of the Potomac. He was born on July 4th, interesting, July 4th, 1872. And he was in the Phi Gamma Delta fraternity, if any of you were in that fraternity. And this is from uh, my friend, uh, William Barclay. And it illustrates the point that Jesus is making. Calvin Coolidge had a characteristic that he took with him 
when long after he became president of the United States. His father often had to go to town and left instructions with Calvin about things that ought to be done before he came back. When his father returned, he never looked to see if these things had been done by young Calvin. He knew that he could rely absolutely on Calvin to do them. It is servants like that that both God and men always need. So what, it, what this is saying is that Calvin Coolidge had integrity. When his father asked him to do something, his father didn't even need to check and see if he'd done it. He knew that he'd done it because he knew his son was a person of integrity. Um, and without uh, seeming uh, to toot my own horn here, <clears throat> when I used to teach law school, which I did from 1982 to 2015, I think that's 33 years, I taught every semester uh, almost without breaking two semesters a year, sometimes summer school. I did take a break a couple of times, but I taught almost every semester. And I taught all about real estate law and lending law and all kinds of sophisticated stuff that none of you guys care about. But at the end of the, all the classes, at the end of the classes, just before I dismissed the students for the final time in the last class, I always gave them a little speech it lasted three or four minutes, and it was exactly what Jesus is saying here. At the time, I didn't understand what Jesus was saying here, so um, uh, it's different. And I, what I was saying was, as a lawyer, you either have integrity or you don't. And if you take a case, you need to work it, whether it's convenient for you or you get paid or anything else. And if you say you're going to do something, you have to do it, whether it's in writing, legally binding or not. Because at the end of the day, all people remember about you is whether you had integrity or you don't. They don't remember whether you drove a Buick or a Cadillac uh, or a Mercedes. They don't remember whether you were a member of a country club or not. All they remember about you was that this person had integrity and was an honest person whose word you could rely on or not. And that's all they remember about you. And so I think what 10 through 13, these verses is saying is that as much as a lawyer hates to admit there's no gray area, either you're a person of integrity and your word is your bond and is good or it's not. And I think that's what Luke is trying to emphasize that Jesus is saying here in verses 10 through 13, that, that we need to be people where we say something, we mean it, and uh, we don't lie and we, we may be shrewd, but we don't cross the line. As you were saying, we don't get close to the edge. We don't cross the edge. We don't fall off the edge. What we say and what we do uh, can, uh, can reflect these verses, that we have integrity in all we say and do. And, and as, I, as I tell others sometimes in a sort of a jovial way, if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> and as my memory is fading, I find that more and more helpful if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. If you tell a bunch of lies, you got to remember which lie that you told to which person. And I don't recommend that. I tried never to do that. And at our age and stage, we shouldn't even try and do it because I can't remember from one day to the next sometimes. And there you have it. Any comments? Conclusions? Doug, this Thanks. is Lane. Hey, Lane. Uh, in this New English Bible, it, it says there was a rich man who had a steward and he received complaints that this man was squandering the property. And the preceding parable in Luke is about the prodigal son who squandered the money, the early inheritance that he got from his father. Yep. So whenever I read this, I didn't see the steward as being somebody that was dishonest in the sense of overcharging for these debts that he ended up reducing but I saw him as somebody who was either having parties with the olive oil or doing stuff that he wasn't supposed to be doing. And the steward found out about it. And that's why he was being let go as opposed to overcharging people for debts. I just didn't see any evidence of dishonesty in regard to what he was charging for uh, the different produce. Yeah, no, I think that's correct. I don't, if we, 
I said a couple of times earlier in the summer, we can't read too much into these parables. We need to let them stand for what they are. When we read Romans, uh, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, we see an entire theological system laid out for us. As contrasted to these parables, which are short snippets of, and they're all short, of what Jesus said to an address a particular concern. So these, these parables are short and sweet, and we shouldn't read too much into them. Let me, um, let me remind you that this parable is a call to action. And so I want to relate to you, uh, but just before we dismiss here, I want to relate to you a cartoon from the great philosopher Charlie Brown. So I'll do my best here. So there's a picture in the first slide of uh, Charlie Brown and Linus walking by, all bundled up in a snowstorm. And in the same slide is, is Snoopy, the dog. And he's, he doesn't have anything on because he's a dog. And he's just sitting there shivering and, and looking very cold and pitiful. And then Charlie Brown says to Linus, uh, well, first of all, uh, Snoopy says, Snoopy looks kind of cold, doesn't he? And then Linus responds, I'll say he does. Maybe we better go over and comfort him. And then the next one, Linus is saying to, to the Snoopy, who's still freezing cold and shivering, Snoopy, be of good cheer. And then Charlie Brown says, yes, be of good cheer. And the final slide is the two little boys walking away and Snoopy with a bubble over his head with a question mark. And this, <laughs> this is, uh, this is uh, the, the way our cartoonist's way of saying to us, um, of saying to us, it's not enough to say to somebody who's poor or homeless or without hope or grieving, be of good cheer and walk away. We actually need to do something. And some of what we need to do maybe is to use our worldly resources to help other people in accordance with this particular parable. So it's a call to action. This parable is a call to action in the same way that Charlie Brown is showing us in this cartoon. It's not just enough to say, um, I'm sorry you're hungry, or I'm sorry you have no shelter, or I'm sorry you are sick, uh, or I'm sorry you're uh, suffering. We need to actually do something about it. And, um, and so it's not just a parable to kind of muse over, it's a parable that's trying to call us into action. And so there you have it. <clears throat> what are we doing next week? Next week, we're, we're going from the unjust or dishonest steward. We're moving on in Luke. We're going to read and study and talk about Luke 18, 1 to 8. And this parable is about the unjust judge, the crooked judge. No such thing. We don't know any of them, but no, we, we certainly don't. But this is a story about a judge that is pretty crooked. And uh, we need to see what Jesus is trying to tell us uh, by this particular uh, parable. Um, and it's, it's a little bit like the unjust steward, but it's different, different message. It's also in Luke, Luke 18, 1 through 8. And somebody asked, is this a role model? And the answer, of course, is no. But let's uh, get a chance, read that one, and uh, we'll talk about it uh, next week. Um, so... Um, um, let's uh, pray and then we'll uh, go about our day and, and try and figure out all the things that we heard today, especially me. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the blessings of our world. Help us to appreciate all we have. Help us to do good with all we have. We thank you for these men, the families they represent. We ask that you would bless them, be with them, strengthen them to do your work in this world and that you would bring us back together in a week so that we may further try and understand your word to us in the New Testament and the words of Jesus, whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you all. Doug, uh, Doug I just wanted to thank you for, put, for doing this for us. We really, it really is well, meaningful. I think I speak for all of us. 
it's my, as you know, it's my pleasure. So thank you for saying that and your kind words, but I love doing it. So here you go. Have a good week. Take Bye. care, you all. Take Bye. care. Bye. Be well. Be safe. Yeah, be well. Be well and be safe. Bye-bye.